Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast. I hate my fucking autofocus, unresolved textual <laughs> tension. <laughs> it's me, your frustrated host, Maria, and my ruggedly handsome co-host. William. William I like there. that you cursed within the first three seconds of this, and I can't do anything to change it. So YouTube algorithm may not uh, be very happy with us. So uh, hit the like button, uh, comment, and we have a Patreon. And speaking of Patreon, this is a Patreon live stream. Though our patrons have sadly left us uh, alone and adrift. We have three. We have four, but they're all part of a silent majority. Um, oh, no, three so of them have commented. Three of them have commented, yes. Okay. Um, and the book we're doing today is Sabriel by Garth Nix. And it's actually pretty easy to remember the author this time. Um, yeah. and this is one of, uh, you know, sometimes we like to do diversity. You know, we feel like we should reach out from our normal thing and bring in people of a, eth you know, ethnicities, sexes, genders, Stop. orientations Stop. that we don't normally. Oh, and we all basically read about 95% uh, lady books. And so today we no, were like, no, female you know what? authored books. Female authored books. Lady Shut books. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, let's do a diversity hire. Let's do a pity read. Let's do Garth Nix. No, no, no. Here's what this actually <laughs> is this is not a pity read. <laughs> Once upon a time during our tithe video, I mentioned that we wanted to go back and revisit books from our childhood um, that we haven't read since we were younger. And we wanted to revisit with the, the eyes of, maturity. of adults and maturity. The 30s. The 30s are here. <laughs> um, and this is one of those books for both Will and I. I read uh, Sabriel and um the entire uh, abortion trilogy because at the time it was just a trilo trilogy in elementary school i was talking about it with my mom she bought me the the trio when i was in elementary school and i think i read it in fourth or fifth grade um and then i reread it like in middle school and i think maybe once in high school uh and then will read it once when he was a youngin I think probably, um, yeah, about the same age. I'm much older than Maria, though. That's why I'm so much more mature um, and grizzled looking. So I probably read it earlier than you did. But um... <laughs> um, I think also, though, this is a very formative book for a lot of kids, I know. And especially in terms of the female representation, I've heard before that this was like one of the like really positive ones. And Garth Nix, in general, as an author, really tries, I feel like, to... Uh, emphasize strong female characters in terms of like at a time too when that was not necessarily common. This is an old book. It was published in 1995 and it was published as a young adult, but really kind of because like it's 12 years old and up. Like that's the the age group so like um because I, I think it's important to kind of understand that because yeah. we think of YA a lot currently as like high school age you know um and and no this was he like a fifth grader reading this i think was absolutely within nix's uh intentions yeah. um and, and it's interesting because it's in a very different mode than a lot of other YA that's out there now. There's no present tense first person. There's no like torrid love triangles. There's no death competitions. There's no dystopia. You know, this is much more of the YA I was used to reading when I was young, um, more so than the where it is as a genre now. And it's... Um very much like akin to the diana Wynne jones and like that era God, and I, I read all 20 of her books when i was young we got to do hers at some point that makes sense i'd love to do hers um but Ever anyway since i got a dog i've been wanting to reread the dog one where he's really the son you I should, forget what that one's called you should reread lyriel there's there's a doggo we'll talk about that later uh and so we we've i, I want to highlight some comments so first off i'm going to do this one uh, Miss Allie Snow said, I didn't finish this book, but I'm here. Thank you. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. it. Uh, and then she said, I probably would have loved this book in elementary school. I did. So probably, yeah. Uh, and then 
Jenny said, I remember reading this book in middle school. I ended up really liking it. I haven't reread it since, but thinking about it brings up fond memories. That is a lot of uh, the vibes. This book is this book is a lot of vibes and for me, a lot of nostalgia. Um, and Ali also said it's OG YA. And it really it is. is. It is. It is YA that was not, I, I don't think Nick's read, uh, wrote this and was like, ah, yes, the 30 year old and 40 year old women. <gasps> what you said once, this. I think, I can't remember which book you said it, but a lot of way, uh, YA now is like high school or high school, but a lot of 30 year old women are reading this. So we're going to put smut in. I, I can't remember. That was the cold open for one of our videos. And like, that really is YA now. It Keeper. <laughs> <laughs> because Keeper very much does not do that. It's definitely yeah. YA or feels more middle grade by modern standards. Um, so Will, how'd you feel about this book? How are we doing, buddy? So to preface a lot of, oh wow, my light is going in and out. Awesome. Um, so to preface, a lot of people in our Discord did not finish this book and did not like it. They felt like the character was too bland, that the world was too telly and not enough showy, things like that. Um, I will revisit the Discord at certain points to bring up comments because- I, Yeah, and I have uh, quotes from the book to back up my opinions because I think it's important for people to know that I'm more right than they are. Um, and so when I started reading this book, that is kind of, I was very aware that that was the criticism going in because again, our patrons read these so much earlier than I do. I read them in the last week and uh, they all read them like as soon as it gets picked. Um, I love this book. I, I unabashedly love this book. This is probably in the top five or seven of the books we've read for this podcast. I loved it so much more than I did as a kid is the funny part. Because as a kid, I remember reading it and being like, oh, that was kind of fun. I read it this time. I loved it. Um, Maria went on to read the sequel, Lyriel and Abhorson. I didn't because I didn't want to ruin the aftertaste of this book. It was too perfect. It left me with that hollow feeling you get after a really good book. I almost went back and reread the second half because I wanted to just be in this world a little bit longer. There are some wonderfully effective uh, scenes in this book. And I know a lot of you who did not like this book are kind of being like, but Will, you're the tough one on books. I am, but also when I really love something, I go hard. So again, yeah. I have brought quotes. I have brought quotes that we will go through that were supposed to be in a nice format, but now look like they didn't format correctly because I got the aspect ratio wrong, but we're not going to talk about that. Maria, what did you think of this book? I flip and loved it. Listen, as a youngin, I preferred Lyriel um as a read because you are much closer. We're going to talk about something we've talked about a lot narrative distance from the main character god damn this fuck nom, 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 focus. <laughs> i think i'm just gonna buy you the the webcam i have because it's cheap i can it... i can fix it i just oh i think i can do it now give me one second uh I, we're gonna we're gonna continue but i i downloaded the stuff so i should be able to fix the well let me talk about distance really quick then while you're doing that the thing about it is that books nowadays tend to have a lot of interiority for their characters um and one of the things i talked about in our uh gideon the ninth and harrow the ninth and even none of the ninth re uh, reviews were my light has no chill at all it's hilarious i'm gonna have we to are doing it off in a second so good technical is if you watch our old videos because uh, i was going through and doing compilations of them you can see how bad some of our tech was back then but uh, apparently it was not entirely decided to cooperate. Anyway, one of the things I criticized in those books was that I felt there was a real lack of interiority to the characters. Um, and a lot of times for people who aren't literature nerds, interiority is like, how much are you in the mind space of the character in terms of like the character talking to themselves, they're thinking, they're reacting, they're feeling. Um, and this book also lacks a lot of that, but I think it works in this case because the tone is set up from the beginning to be very distant from the characters and very sort of mythic in tone it's a very here i'm gonna put myself full screen so you guys can see how cool i am and oh, yes. it's very and it's very yeah maria's picking her nose right now maria they can't see you flashing the camera oh god i'm so glad that we're not full screen right now <laughs> there's nothing to see anyway am i right I'm so funny. You guys can't see Maria's faces. The tone is very set up as very mythic and it's very distant to begin with. You actually, I was rereading the first chapter because I like to do close readings. I call them reverse critiques where I go through and I comment on it uh, on the chapter as if I was doing a critique of the chapter, but I do basically the positive parts that I like. 
the main character is described from a third person point of view and it's not until page three that you actually get her first thoughts and so all of these things add up so that later when there isn't as much interiority for the character you're not missing it it doesn't feel like something that isn't there it feels like this is a deliberate choice and i will argue that one of the ways that you actually really feel who Liri, uh who sabriel is is through her actions and her agency and her talking because she is an incredibly active character um she is a character who like from the minute go knows what she's doing and where she's going um it's interesting because we'll get into the plot but usually there's a mentor type character for these for these um types of stories there isn't one here she just knows what she's she's just like i'm gonna go on this quest um usually the inciting incident for a character leaving their like comfortable life to go on the quest is like the bad guy comes in and burns down the village uh in this case no her dad is like hey help me out and she's like i got you uh, and that's not to say she's an invincible character or a Mary Sue. She still has a lot of insecurities that I think come through really well in the writing. But it is, um, it, it does help characterize her and make you feel like she's specific. Again, one of the criticisms from our reader, our Discord, was that she felt very like a default character. Um, and as we go through the book, I'll talk about. God. Awesome. Now it's not popping in and out, but it's just out of focus the whole time. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Look. There's no autofocus. I can move and it's not annoying. <laughs> okay. okay, I've talked about this book for a while. So yes. you take main screen, um, you say what you want to say. So for me, I get a lot of people's criticisms and I think Will has done a really good job. This book reminds me of how Lord of the Rings is written. It's got that mythic, epic uh, quality to it where... Uh, the main, like a lot of things I've heard uh, about the movie Lord of the Rings versus the books, which I agree with, is that the actors give the characters more personality and and a little bit, they're, they're easier to relate to than they are in the books themselves. Some people might disagree with it, um, disagree with that, but they're very much, they feel more archetypal in which makes sense for Tolkien's goals that he had writing those books. And that is a little bit what uh, the distance in this book feels like. What I will say is the narrator's fu very funny. The narrator is hysterical. And I think it's, it's Tim really Curry, by the way, which everybody who knew who that was except me. Um, yes. And the voice he does for Moggett, the cat, is so much. He's hitting so much above his pay grade. That's it's not what I meant, though. I wasn't talking about fine, the audio fine, book fine. narrator. Go back. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't. Okay, go ahead. The actual, because there is a narrator. There is an omniscient narrator who comments on stuff because there are times when it's in nobody's point of view. I just started uh, a course and, and it's not from anyone's point of view. It is just the narrator giving you this sweeping, like, uh, description of what's happening. The narrator, this omniscient narrator floating around is hysterical. There's a lot of witty things snuck into the narration that I found very engaging um, and uh, fantastic. He also imbues personality in, in very subtle, uh, and here I'm talking about Sabriel, in very subtle ways. There is this fantastic scene where she's fucking, oh well. I'm it's okay, we're, we're, we're past 10 minutes in, so we're okay. Uh, where she's messing with a guard uh, on purpose, and she's got this very prim finishing uh school slash like a uh, boarding school vibe to her and she like m is messing with this guy using magic on a purpose and you get this idea that she's like she might be really like presentable but she's also a little bit of a um like she has a sense of humor i love how when she doesn't know what to do if somebody approaches her politely she will respond politely and a lot of things are like i wonder what my uh etiquette teacher like like she had n no examples of how to respond to this based on her etiquette teachers uh teachings and those kinds of things really gave me a lot of who she was but in super it's not heavy it's it's very subtle versus if you guys read lyriel you spend a lot of time in that girl's head. You you know how she feels about stuff. You immediately understand her personality. But that book is much slower. Plot-wise, Sabriel has it. It is get up, go, go, go. Every, like, 
there is no lag in that story. It just keeps pumping. Uh, versus Lyriel, where the first half of the book is just getting a feel for the characters and having them like develop a little bit, but in the same place that they are. They're like everybody's just mushing around. It's funny because I think that's one of the big one of the things we talked about about the differences between you and me, besides how much more handsome I am, is that as a reader, I really like don't like books that faff about. I like books that just start. Whereas you like a more introspective uh, amount. And so I can see why, you know, that would be a difference between how you and I read Lyriel because spoiler alert, I didn't love Lyriel when I read it. I was, I was young and I'm not even necessarily opposed to reading it now, but I just didn't want to, cause I didn't want to ruin the aftertaste of Sabriel. She gets to be like an old person in sit in Lyriel. And I don't want to do that. Um, there's some she's good comments. She's not old. She's like 33. I'm 32. That's old. Uh, you, you go ahead and read son of a bitch. The bloom of youth has uh what was it in uh oh <laughs> the 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 um bloom of youth had faded from her cheeks. Exactly. Uh I'm gonna go handle my light, which has no chill. You go okay. ahead and read some of the comments because there's some interesting ones, I think. Okay. So Allie says, I don't have a ton to say just because I don't have the nostalgia factor going for me. And I did feel her personality was lacking. What I will say is I enjoyed, because we talked about the nostalgia factor, Young Maria much preferred Lyriel and Aborson as a book than Sabriel. I enjoyed Sabriel so much more as an adult. So I would say, while I definitely have that nostalgia factor. It is a book from a very specific time in my life. I find, I appreciated that it settled, uh, hilarity of the narration i appreciated um a lot of i i appreciated Sab sabriel a lot more as an adult than i did as a kid as a kid i found her a little bit bland which i eventually will make an argument why that works for children as children's literature but i as an adult i found a lot more of her personality through the subtle cues in the narration um so it's actually interesting that i really enjoyed this way more than i did when i was a kid um, Jenny said, I think people have gotten so used to present tense and first person point of view in YA that books that deviate from that from the start in reader's opinion uh, as met and have to work upwards from there. I do. I completely agree with that. I think they're definitely because even when I was in high school, none of the YA I was reading. So, for instance, um, in high school, it was more like uh, Graceling and like that era of books that I was reading, which Guys, definitely I hate is Graceling so I much. Know. I tried I... to start it three times and I couldn't do it. Buddy, stay on topic. I was in the middle <laughs> of saying something. Get the fuck out. <laughs> okay, here we go. Go ahead. Um, You're back to solo layout. Thank you. Um, and so I definitely have a huge portion of my YA reading that is that, but I. I I don't know. I, I really like this. It feels very fresh and different for me because it's nothing like a lot of the books you're reading. I, I think the closest is Dune that has this omniscient narrator that pops in and out of people's head, uh, which is of the books we've read. That's the closest. Not that this at all feels like Dune. Makes sense, too, that like since I like Dune so much. Yes. Um, again, I think, yeah, kind of going back to it, there is a this is what people are used to now younger readers especially is a and this is not to say like oh they don't know real literature just what they're used to is different than what i was used to growing up and so this feels different and they do have to work uphill i think yeah from that okay miss Allie snow said i kept wishing she was traveling with someone just so she had another character play to play off of then she got to the house and i liked mogget and realized no that wasn't it so it's funny, right after she gets to the house, once she leaves, she immediately gets a traveling partner and the two of them butt heads and have conversations and develop like, there's this adorable bathtub scene. Like <laughs> you stopped right before you got what you wanted, Allie. Uh, and it's great because I really, I remember as a young girl not liking the romance between Sabriel and Touchstone. And as an adult, I really flipping loved it. Like. I was such Guys, a little sad shipper. I ship it. I ship it. I so, oh, it, it was cute. I, yeah, it's, it's so funny. Cute. I like this, the romance, and I like Sabriel as a character so much more so now much as an adult. Like, she, like, I, I don't know. There's a lot of little touches that I really loved about her and her personality. Yeah. Um, um, one thing I will say, you go ahead. Sorry. I just want to get through all the comments. Uh, I mean, 
Will called this an old book because it was written in the 90s. So I've read my share of old school YA, but not recently. Yeah. And that's the thing is, for me, this was also the oldest YA book we've read thus far. You guys know all the book I've read recently. because For the last it. year or two, almost. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then One Jenny night. says, I remember liking Sabriel for not being overtly, this is who I am, girl boss, get over it, which I feel is common in YA. Oh my god, and she's not sassy, which is such a relief. I hate those stupid sassy characters we keep running into. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that part of it is, you know, Maria said that this is kind of a perfect storm for me of character of things I like in books, and that's kind of the case is that you know I like a more distance tone because I feel like it's the real literature. Um, and then um, also there's you know she's not sassy, which is nice. The descriptions are beautiful at points so i really appreciated that there's no faffing about those are all things that i really really like in books it, this book is basically just everything will likes mm -hmm. all the, the except for there's one thing that we both did not like. yes there's one thing that we both went why the heck did you do it nix and we'll get to it uh but like i just said i really like the romance but he decides to uh he overplays his hand just a little bit at the end, just a touch. Like, there's a point at which you should stop, and he 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 took a step, and I don't like that. Step is not good. Um, but overall, I I really enjoyed this. I think it's a great read. Um, I reminded my mom it exists, so she might reread it because she read it back in the day too. We should get Maria, mom, uh, a mini video, like ten minutes of her talking about it. That would be so cute. Yeah, and she's got a great voice for it too. I would never be able to get my mom to do it. Hey, mom. I know. Even though she'd be great. I but could do one of those. Such good feedback. Yeah, I mean, it would just be one of those videos where you just see like a sound signal going up and down instead of like our faces. That would no, work. no, no. Get get uh, like a little chibi version of your mom's face. <laughs> yeah, a VTuber. Um, so one yeah. thing before we start on the plot, I did want to say is that the way I'm going to approach this book is that usually when I'm talking about a book, uh, a bad book, I am making a statement that this book is objectively bad, but it's okay that you like it. In this case, I'm kind of making the opposite, which is that I think this book is objectively good, but I think it's okay not to like it. Oh, okay, I good. think Phew. No, I think it's okay. Again, I think there are certain, this book is really a perfect storm of things I like in books, and I think it's okay to go, did you think I was going to say objectively you're wrong? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, well, no. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> that would be so much funnier, but <laughs> no, I, I get why people don't uh, might not like this. Like it really is. There's a certain amount of taste going in. Um, and again, I'm gonna prove my point through uh, quotes and things like that. But um, Maria, why don't you get us started on the plot, and I will allow you to be full screen for your storytelling and hand gestures. I get. So this book opens up on a dark night. There is a group of travelers, which are like these. They, 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 they live in wagons. They travel around. They're travelers um and uh this woman stumbled into their camp she was having a heckin baby they saved the baby but the the woman died and they're like oh no they put the charter mark and you discover that the charter mark has because there's a charter mage it immediately you get the idea that this is a religious but also magical thing that is happening because the charter mage has a soot mark on his head and um when he puts it over the baby, he like does the thing, and then the soot goes from his forehead to the baby's forehead, and you're like, oh, heck and magic. This is what kind of world we're in. And, um, but then the baby starts to die, and they're like, oh no, that's, what a bummer to our night, guys. And then out of the trees comes this very pale, dark-haired man with a deep voice, like, no, that baby's still hanging on. I'm going to get her back. And they look at him and he, they're like, oh, no, he's got the bells of a necromancer. But then they're like, but his bells have charter marks and charter marks is like good controlled magic. And then there's something called free magic, which is like wild and chaotic. But his bells have charter marks on it. So they're like, no, he's not a necromancer who only uses free magic. He is the abhorsen, um, which is basically he's the anti necromancer. <laughs> he, he sends things back to death and the necromancer police. Yes, uh, it's one guy. For the amount of necromancers <laughs> and like evil things, there really should be more than one. I don't know why we've committed to just one, but whatever, it is what it is. Um, and he's like, I'm gonna go fetch that baby. And they're like, 
you're going to bring the baby back from the dead. And he was like, she's still at the first gate. So he goes in and he goes to find the baby. And you're kind of like, why are you, why are you rescuing this baby, my guy? Like, what's up? Um, and he goes in. It's so funny. I narrate books the exact same way, whether I adored them and they were atmospheric or if I thought they were bad. Anyway, it's the same, uh, same tone, humor, slightly humorous tone, irreverent. Yeah, it is actually funny. Uh, you can tell, though, we like it a book more when we're more energetic in the video yeah. in general. It's like there's a big difference. Uh, one thing I will say is that, hey, we should have made the joke about him being Necromancer Batman because he has a bat cave later. He has a house. What are you talking about? He has a bat cave. It's a house on a yeah. It's not an island. actual cave. It's not an actual cave, but it's it's still the Bat Cave because it's his spot. You it's a you girls don't understand about comics. And the thing I about it do. is, I'm very familiar with Batman, <laughs> but that's an actual <laughs> underground thing underneath his actual house. I don't think your your analogy or metaphor lands. So. There. There we anyway. go. Perfect. Um, one thing I will say is that um, I did like this opening uh, prologue because it is very kind of atmospheric. Um, I think it's a little bit, and it helps again set the tone of like this is epic events happening in a kind of magical world that again is sort of a Lord of the Rings esque in terms yeah. of the tone in the world. Um, and just to put it really quickly, um, we're in. Uh, there's two kingdoms separated I'm get by. There. All right, here. We don't need it now. Take the responsibility. Take the reins. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, and you're like, why are you going into, into death, buddy? But he goes in, and it's a river. And so you, and there's multiple gates. And he's like, good, she's still on the side of the gate because he can hear her. But as he wades through the river of death, he sees this black creature shadow with these burning eyes holding the baby. And he was like, Kerrigo. I thought I banished you past the sixth gate years ago. And Carol goes like, I'm back, bitches. Um, and also like, <laughs> this is a heckin' nice baby. And the abortion's like, that's my baby. And they have a little tussle. Uh, the baby falls into the river. He has to grab her up. He banishes. He takes one of the bells out of his bandolier that's strapped across his chest. And he does a heckin' gonging of the bells. And it casts Carol back past the second gate. So what you learn in this opening is that this guy can go into death. And this is what I mean by, because none of this is explained to you. The narration doesn't stop and say, yes, there are nine gates of death. Um, but what you get is that there, you can go into death. It is a river that has multiple gates you have to get through. His job is at Borson is to ban it, like get people past the certain gate. At this point, you don't know how many gates there is, but you get the idea that banishing something past the sixth gate is pretty significant. How did he get back up to the first gate? And the implication is there are other people, baddies, necromancers, who have been helping him get out. And he's like, no, I shall banish you again. Um, and that if something is still on the first side of the first gate, you can probably still bring it back to its body. And so he grabs the baby and they step back into life. Um, and uh, they're like, this baby has no one, the travelers. And he's like, no, nah, it's my kid. That, that was that was my wife. <laughs> <that died. laughs> uh, this is Sabriel. And uh, they're like, oh, how are you going to take care of this baby? And he's like, well, I guess, man, I have to travel a lot. What am I going to do? And he's like, can we just live with you guys? You band of travelers? Can we just stay with you? And that way, when I have to go deal with stuff, she has someone to take care of her. And they're like, yeah, that's chill. Uh, and that's how the prologue ends. And then it fasts forward to Sabriel as an 18, 19 year old woman. But she's in a world that feels very much like a 1940s or 30s version of our world. Uh, and you're like, well, that's kind of weird. And what you get is that, as Will was saying, there are two parts of this world. There's Anselskier, which is like our world in the 1930s or 40s. They've got lights, electricity, cars, guns, the whole nine yards. And then there is this wall. And on the other side of the wall is the old kingdom. Um, and that is where, you know, that whole prologue happened because magic and death and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the wall keeps things out. But all along the wall, there are like army patrols making sure nothing comes in from the one side or goes through the other side to kind of keep them separate. But our girl Sabriel, since the age of about five, has been at a 
boarding school for girls called Wyverly College. Um, and she is just like the book opens and she has found a dead rabbit on uh, just in the road. And you get the idea that she knows whose rabbit this is and it's kind of sad. And she hears a little girl calling for Bunny. And Sabriel's like, mm, this kind of sucks. So she chooses, <laughs> uh, she takes out a little bell and she like, Doo -doo -doo -doos, uh, and the bunny comes back to life. And you get, oh, Sabriel is like her papa. She can do the heckin' magics and bring things back from the from life. And then the little girl comes up and is like, why is Bunny covered in blood? And Sabriel's like, I don't know. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> and the little girl's like, was she dead? And there's a moment of fear in the little girl. And then Sabriel acts like a prefect because she is a prefect um, and scolds the little girl from being out of her bedroom. And the little girl's like, oh, okay, I'm going to go back now. But what you get from this is... Go. One thing I was going to say is that, yeah, one of the, the nice touches here and where I'll start saying that Sabriel actually has a very distinct personality is that, A, she's going against her father's rules. And the other thing is that she's kind of scared of death a little, a little bit. And it talks about how she doesn't quite want to know what she knows about death. At the same time that she is still a very confident character, there's this sort of dread that will grow throughout the book that starts here um oh sorry i just wanted to <laughs> highlight a comment we, when you were saying that uh Bat he's cave. batman ali says does that make ma get alfred <laughs> it kind of does it kind of does ali you saved you saved the comparison for me i'm on board now i'm on i'm board. telling you uh, he's like ali a sassy alfred ali also said i did like the prologue it was creepy creepy and atmospheric um, I think Allie is going to be our third co-host for this. So, uh, you know, if you want to make any Jenny jokes, popping in. if you want to be like, oh, you shouldn't say that to anything I say, we'll put it on screen. That's uh, usually what Katie does here. So <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so again, and you also get that she cares about uh, the people around her, but that the other thing that you get from her is she will fall back on the roles she is comfortable with when she doesn't know what to do so again in this instance the little girl was like i'm pretty sure my bunny was dead how the heck <laughs> did you make my bunny come back to life and sabriel's like why are you out of bed right now i if you're not back in bed in seven minutes i will tell mistress whatever that you were and the little girl's like oh crap i have to go but immediately is able to deal with this uncomfortable weird situation by falling back on the roles she's comfortable with and this is something that happens multiple times throughout the book she's a prefect she's a straight a student there's an etiquette teacher like this girl has definitely got posh british finishing school vibes about her which i love because you never see that in a female we're so used to protagonists that are like I like roughhousing with the boys or you know, <laughs> I hunt by myself because I can support myself. Pick me girls. Yeah. Or, or just like, I'm just sassy move, too, you know, and, and mm -hmm. heckin' sassy. And, and Sabriel is like, I don't know how to respond to that based on my etiquette school teaching. So I'm going to do my best, like, you know, but she's, she's got this quiet confidence and competence about her that I adore. Um, and I think I think the reason as a young girl, I liked Sabriel as much as I did was I was very much used to main characters that I found really annoying, that made really dumb decisions. And I was like, <laughs> why would you do that? Even I, as a fifth grader, know that that's a dumb as heck decision. And while Sabriel has moments where she's scared and she makes decisions and hey, so I'm like, yeah, no, fair enough. That was a weird situation, my girl. Um, and so I, I like the competency. And as a young girl, seeing a competent, but also kind of like proper like feeling the femininity but also mm -hmm. badass main character who was also smart and had good grades god that that really i connected so hard with her like as much as lyriel is much more of a immediate personality i like like young me wanted to be sabriel more than lyriel just because lyriel starts out real extra extra spressy <laughs> teenager um miss ally snow says she's a balanced character she is um but anyway yeah, she... that's something i really appreciated this time around i think as a kid i don't remember particularly liking or disliking sabriel but in this case yeah i like that kind of polish to her character and one of the things that happens at this point is that 
she mentions that she has friends at Wyverly and she sort of cares about uh, staying with them as as they grow older but we never learn their names there's never any specifics about them and so that's a place where you would think like okay she feels vague because the author didn't do the work to actually give specifics but again i think it's overshadowed by a your distance from her and b her actions make her such a specific character yeah and i think it that is a place though that nix could have made connecting to sabriel easier if he had fleshed her out a little bit more in those ways um again for me i think that's like fine and i love sabriel but i wanted to highlight uh another comment jenny says maria just said what i was thinking sabriel was likable to me because she was competent and capable and ali said and that's a valid way to make the character relatable yeah she i have i <laughs> thank you co-hosts um yeah i really liked her as a character and we'll we'll get into again and she's not overpowered i think which really yeah. helped as well yes um especially in the climax oh god i can't wait to get there oh, anyway anyway um so she tonight's a special night she's going to be graduating soon it's her last year and her, her father is supposed to come visit her you learn that her father has only visited her like once or twice a year all of her years that she's been at wyverly but she's super close to him how may would that happen would you ask well he comes and visits her as like a ghost corporeal form on full moons when the wind is blowing like the right way from the old kingdom um and uh they can talk in this one like study room in the school that she like picks for the specific night and he has been able to teach her the skills of being in a person through these meetings and so she's still seeing him once or twice a month every like year and so she is very fond of her father but she's waiting in the room for her father to come meet with her and midnight comes and he hasn't shown up and she's like wow he is never late what the heckity heck is happening and then they're screaming and she's like ah oh, this doth not bode well and she goes out and the girls are like freaking out because there is a shadow hand this creature from death and she sees a tiny like black line leading away from it so she knows that someone is controlling it she's like okay and it's not hurting anyone it's not doing anything it's just like you know <laughs> in the space and everybody's like oh ah, what is this and so she's like i gotta go into death and her uh one teacher is like what are, what are you doing and she's like don't worry i got this and so she goes into death and it's this hand and she has to like help it speak and then it basically says her name and it tries to hand her something and she picks it up and it is her father's sword, the sword of, uh, it's her father's sword and his bandolier of bells, which is his tools that he uses to banish uh, the bed, the bed, the dead. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's like, oh no, oh no, this can't be good. If Papa sent me this, then this is like he something. And then she realizes cause the, the shadow hands string is leading back through the second gate. It's not in, it's not going out to life. It is through death. And she realized, holy shit, my dad is stuck in death. And she goes back and she has the, like all of a sudden she pops back in and she's holding up the sword and bandolier and her teacher's like, you weren't holding those before. And she re realizes my dad's in trouble. I need to get across the wall and figure out what's going on. Like, and, and this is immediately, like, she's not told to do anything. This is where you see that capable, that, like, this is a, she's she's not a passive character. She immediately is like, I got to do something. Well, and again, it's not a reactive choice in the way that usually this would be, like, a monster attacking from the bad guy and the village gets burned down. This is, like, her father needing help and her deciding, oh, this is what I need to go do this. There's no mentor who's like, you must go to the mountain or I don't know that th those fantasy trope. Don't, don't, don't eyebrow touch. <laughs> that was me. such a good, that was such a good Ganda. Thank Gandalf. you. Yes. Thank you. I okay, really, thank it's you. just, I'm so not used to you like affecting a board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that doing it actually well. Uh, so Jenny says in terms of uh, making a competent character, uh, and that's something you don't see often anymore. The main female character is often badass, but still making idiot choices to move the plot along. And um, Miss Ali Snow says that's because the author is prioritizing plot over the character arc. I think that's such a good point, is that yeah. a lot of times they're kind of 
kind of backfilling why the character would do something because they want the care the plot to work out a certain way um and it kind of hurts the novel and the coherency of it where that doesn't really happen here sabriel's decisions always feel like hers and jenny says or the other characters need to be lesser in capabilities or character development to make the reader like the main character more as an example these violent delights god we are never going to stop bragging on that book man <laughs> um but yeah no so that's exactly it she really is a, a really unique character and again i understand why a lot of people on a first read are struggling to connect with her but man her competence and capability which isn't to say she doesn't make mistakes and she can't always do the stuff she's supposed to but we got max here all right yes! third <laughs> co-host coming in clutch mm -hmm. um I was going to say, yes, Sabre has agency. I'll totally give her that. I'm Miss Lisa Snitz. One other thing is that often characters, it's morally you don't care about them so long as they're driven and competent. This is why a lot of anti-heroes work. Um, it also helps if they're hot and funny, which uh, Sabriel isn't. But like, you know, if you think about Game of Thrones and the kind of things like that, um, that kind of thing is actually usually more important to making a character likable. Though, I mean saying that a lot of people didn't like her so but but in general you know that's a precept of writing yep um and ali also says which is valid i think i'm just coming up against that distance and wanting more of a connection with her and again that valid. distance can be really hard it, it's something that gives me a really hard like and i spoke about this with um kushiel's dart it took me forever to care about the character because I was not emotionally in her. I mean, thank God I wasn't emo like right there in her mind when she was a, an annoying flipping child. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it does make it hard to connect with characters when there is that distance. Anyway, you know, I really liked Sabriel and she's not hot and bitchy, which is usually the archetype I like. I know. I Weird. Anyway, Good writing. <laughs> we need to, I need to. I'm yeah, gonna we're going to have really to hurry fast. through. So basically yeah. what happens is she decides, okay, I'm going to, here, I'm going to go full screen. You're yeah. going to, you guys are going to miss Maria, but it's okay. Um, so she decides, okay, I'm going to go help my papa. And that means she has to go by the wall. And the wall is protected by a bunch of World War One type British uh, people. And it's, there's a, the people south of the wall have like this incredible Britishness to them, which is really <laughs> funny. Is they're just like every Especially British. Especially since he's Australian. Oh yeah, no, oh, Garth Nix is. I was like, I thought yeah. that, yeah. No, yeah, Garth Nix. And um, this is one of the parts I think where people were talking about. Okay, so this is the part where which happens. Um, oh, whoa. Actually, you're on screen for this one because this is the part where she makes fun of that soldier. Ah, yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, anyway, so she goes up and she's just marching along, you know, like she's got her documents and everything. And then this like super like uh, soldier comes up and he's like, hey, you. Go, what are you doing? Why, why are we going there? And she's like, oh, yeah, this guy is not actually very high ranking. He's just trying to prove himself. And she's like, I don't mess with this dude. And he's like, why are your papers? Give it, give it, give it here. Why are your papers, girl? You can't go across. And she uses a charter spell to just make her documents, which are in her bag, appear in her hand. And it, like, freaks the guy out. But what she doesn't know is that this area is defended by a bunch of charter mages and what you have here is a really nice blend of like a world war one pre-world war two military and then they're literally next to a magic kingdom that shit sometimes comes across so they also have to use charter magic yeah it's sort of ad hoc where like command doesn't know what's going on but the people on the wall have like little salvaged things or one of the big things is that they used to have the dead were constantly rising of in their own dead and they didn't know what to do it was a military zone yeah yeah um and what happened is that uh her father actually crafted some pipes because again sound is how you control the dead um in this world to basically keep them dead all the time and this is i think the part where one of our patrons complained about how it felt more telly than showy because her the the main british guy of uh, the colonel i don't remember his name oh um, i loved him oh i'm great. so sad we forgot his name 
He was so nice. Over? He dies at the end. Yeah, it was. There was a little bit of a, a tragic part there, but um, he is. He takes her skis and he's walking with her, and he tells her this whole history about him and a horse and what happened at the wall. And I didn't really feel like this was too showy because it's only like a page, and also it's interesting stuff. Like you really get a sense for what's going on with the world, and I just like that world building. And for me, the more important aspect of that conversation was that she had no idea how significant her father was. Like once she, they see the bandolier and, and her, her sword, this general guy, like he's, he's the guy second in command in charge of this base. And he sees it and he was like, oh, and, and she also looks like him. She, she, he was like, are you the Abhorsen's, um daughter? And she was like, yeah. And he was like, I knew your dad. And she was like, what? And you realize <laughs> that as much as she's close to her dad, she has no clue about what he actually does outside of he banishes the dead. She has no idea that he came to the side of the wall and that he did this thing. And it is through this conversation, it's less about what her dad did than the fact that she didn't know he did it. And that this was a something that happened. Um, exactly. Ali uh, says, you get the impression of Porson did not toot his own horn. Exactly. This isn't about just telling character detail because the guard doesn't say your father doesn't uh toot his own horn because that would be telling uh and not showing but what it shows is that her dad did not toot his own horn and did not engage with her in that way like it wasn't about him and his deeds he was very much about there being for his daughter and educating his daughter and that's what it's showing which is i think the important part yes. um the the this guy also is very concerned because Abriel is like the same age as his daughter. And he was like, are you sure you want to go across there? Like sometimes our scouting parties don't come back. And recently it's been real crazy on the other side of the wall because they do patrols. Um, and he was like, are, are you sure? And she's like, I, I kind of have to. <laughs> um, and he's like, well, okay. If, if Abhorsen, if Abhorsen is dead or stays in death after a week, um, these flutes are going to stop working. Working, and so we now have a uh, 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 a Time countdown limit. Yeah, Time limit, yes, and, to uh, 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 to make her quest more intense. Yeah, because they have to wait for the moon to be full again. Uh, and so, and and now he's invested because to keep his thing running, even though he does not want to send this nineteen year old girl to do this very dangerous thing, he's like, oh shit, this is going to affect me and my people. Uh, and so she goes across and. Um, she as she goes across she needs to summon a guide to get her to her dad's house because she doesn't actually know how to get to her dad's house she's the been there the, she's been there a couple <laughs> of times um but she was like four and five so she she don't remember um and she summons this sending in death and it is super great because the sending she summons is a woman and what a sending is is it's a magical creation that has a spirit inside it um, and, and is imbued with charter magic. And the sending she summons from death, and her, her dad has told her, you can only summon this sending once every seven, or three times every seven years. <laughs> Be super careful. And the first time she ever summoned this, is the funniest this sending, part. it is so funny, was when she got her period and she was panicking because she, she can ask the sending anything and it will give her answers. And she was like, what's my period? Like panicked summoned this but what she her theory that has never been confirmed to her but she knows in her little heart is true is that it's her mother because it's it's a womanly shape and she calls it like she'll be like hi mother and it can't say anything except when she asks it questions uh, but I love the idea of just like getting your period in an all girls school nobody's really taught you anything about it and being like and to be fair ah! that is uh, that is a calamity on uh, on par with I need to figure out where my dad's bat cave is. <laughs> like if if that does seem like, oh my God, am I dying? Uh, yeah, one thing happened in Poppy War. And, but, and uh, so you literally have to go into death some <laughs> yeah, this that day. That's actually very funny. It's great. I love it. Um but anyway, uh and she gets the the sending basically tells her, hey. Uh, this is how you get there. You need to go. You need to not stop. You need to hustle the entire way there. Do not stop for anything. Go, Sabriel. Be safe, my darling. And you're like, oh, mama spirit. You 
that's so cute. Anyway, and so she starts following the map that uh, the sending gave her, but she stops at, um, oh no, this is when she does it. I skipped this thing. She has to stop at this uh, stone so she can enter death more easily. Um, but there is like a dead creature who's been like kind of waiting around and it attacks her. Well, okay, so actually what happens too is that at this point she keeps seeing dead bodies of soldiers who have been mm -hmm. out on rangings. Um, and I actually thought this was a really nice character touch in that she kind of helps banish their souls into death. And it's she didn't have to do this, but it's a nice way of characterizing who she, who she is, is, that she chooses to do this. Again, you're not necessarily told in her thoughts why she's doing a thing, doing but this. you see the action of it. And one of the things about this book is that because the dis your distance back, it's almost like you're piercing together her character actively. Like every little touch makes you go, okay, what can I, how can I fit this into the web? And again, that didn't work for some people, but for me, it really did work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, uh, so while she's like getting all these guys funeral rites together and she literally is in death talking to her mother sending this like creature <laughs> uh, and it's great because the narration stops being from Sabriel's point of view during this scene and goes to this creature. And you get a little like micro slice of this creature's life, which is it died hundreds of years ago. It doesn't even remember its actual name, but it's taken a new name that it can say in its dead mouth now. And it has just been waiting in death for an opportunity to get back into life. It has been hanging on. And it's just such a like vibe of a scene. The thing about this is that it's weird because I usually like less um, formalized magic systems, like hard magic systems, as they mm -hmm. say. And this book actually has a fairly hard magic system, but the magic is so creepy and atmospheric throughout. I don't quite know how he does both of it because you're right. There is this sense that this is just like this weird ghost creature that's been hanging on like a ghoul and it, it's hungering and it's it's very it's very cool i wasn't quite sure why he included this part like it does characterize her but i was i was thinking like in terms of if you have to cut down stuff this so might here's be cut. here's what it does what it shows you is this creature has been waiting to get out of death for hundreds and hundreds of years and how it got out was somebody sacrificed a charter because there's a charter stone. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I know. Uh the charter stone. <laughs> okay. They're they're magical, uh, these stones of power that can enable you to do magic more easily and they keep bad things at bay, but it's broken. Somebody destroyed this charter stone. And the only way to do that is to use the blood of a charter mage. And this was a great happening. And something came through because this creature says when the this creature went through it opened the door and hundreds of dead just came out and followed this evil presence and you as a reader are like oh was it Karagor from the beginning the guy who was holding Beba Sabriel um it is it is Karagor. <laughs> um but anyway and this creature her is also the thing that then makes Karagor pay attention to her if I yes. remember correctly yes yeah. um and uh this creature attacks her while she's in dead death talking to the yeah and he, like he fucked around and found out yeah <laughs> it's like he did not expect to run into an abortion <laughs> and she's like Ga -ga, goodbye um and she deals with it but then she's like oh shit there are dead here there's things happening and she starts like heckin going and as she's going she starts getting this creepy suspicion that she's being followed by something so she starts hustling because it's this dead this death presence just coming up behind her and she has to like climb up one thing steps. i did like, like is that before this she had skis which is like such an unheroic thing but makes sense if you're going it cross was... country <laughs> it's when she's just skiing down the slopes and it's like really this is supposed to be like a cool fantasy novel but like and it does kind of make sense well, um, and yeah so she knew it was winter because in Wyverly it's like spring and she was like she knew it was going to be winter and she's like how am i going to get across this distance i have ski use what you have you know Mm -hmm. she's economical she's practical boom yeah no that's good character you're right um and so yeah she starts feeling this thing following her and what we find out is that it is a mordicant which is like a greater dead, dead. summoning type thing um and she is 
fucking terrified of this thing and it is super creepy and she just keeps running um and it is from such it. a building like because it gets closer and at first she's not sure what it is and then there's this point where she's going up these stairs and she can hear it like she can hear it and then she looks and she sees this creature with fire coming out of its mouth and she's like oh fuck it's a mordekin and earlier when she was talking to that general person she was like yeah i'm an abhorsen i banished a mordekin was a really weakened one because it had gotten through to the other side of the wall so it was like super easy to deal with and she's like she remembers that she was like she bragged about killing that mordekin but this is not at all the same um and she's trying to get to the house like cave. to for safety you know and there's this one point where she um, needs to open a door really quickly celia says hello peeps joining in from work once again have i read the book no can i contribute anything to this conversation about the book also no but i'm here we Thanks. appreciate you deeply and any insight you may have into the book from listening to us yeah um so yeah and there's this great scene where she has to open this door but it's not opening and the mordicant has finally reached the level she is and it's like barreling towards her and she finally gets in but then its hand is through the door and she can't close it and then all of a sudden this sending which is again basically think of them as like ghost people but they're silvery and kind of glittery and it's it's wearing the outfit of a previous abhorsen with a sword and it like smacks the mordicant closes the door and she's like oh like she she collapses and it's like oh thank god and then the sending is like no you need to go <laughs> then she starts hearing the mordicant banging on the door and she realizes that door is not gonna hold and the, the sending is like shoo shoo go go and she's like oh crap so she gets up and she starts running again she gets through another door and there's uh, another sending that's like you got to go across that and she looks and there's this massive river um and it's oh, the rattling time for the quote um because this is the part that is a little bit funny let's see okay here we go maria you do the reading because you read much okay. better than i do so she's looking at the river a little to her right, a scant few paces away, this mighty river hurled, hurled itself over the cliff to make a truly glorious waterfall. Sabria leaned forward a little to look at the waters crashing below, creating a huge white wings of spray that could have easily swallowed her entire school, new wing and all, like a rubber duck swamped in an unruly bath. And it's just so great. Wait, put this, the quote back up. Oh, 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 okay. So what I'd like to, in, so when I was saying that the narration itself is really funny, is uh, the, the commentary it's giving, because this isn't Sabriel giving commentary, it's the narrator, and the um, the white wings of spray that could easily swallow her entire school, and new wing and all, so we've had two wing things, like a rubber duck who has mm -hmm. wings swamped in an unruly bath, and it's just such a, because this is such a tense scene, and then all of a sudden we got a rubber duck. And it's just so, it's this nice little vague tension breaker, but also you're panicking because now she has mm -hmm. to cross this giant river that there's a waterfall right there, like right over there. And it's stones that are just above the river. Like, um, and then and, also this part, if you can read. Um, even as the thought passed through her mind, Sabriel saw a glow that sharpened into a bright tracing of a doorway. She half gasped, half cried out, both silent human noises drowned out by the unholy, inhuman screech of the mordicant. It was past the doorkeeper. So rather than like, this gives you a feeling of like, oh, I really love his prose. But one thing I noticed here is she half gasped, half cried out. It's, it's the language that is specific in terms of cried out that like, what kind of a weirdo cries out like in a more normal book that would be kind of a weird um description but because it has that slightly more mythic lord of the rings feel that's how he uses language to kind of draw you in and create a tone for me it's that both slight human noises like these weren't loud cries or gasps mm -hmm. both slight human noises drowned out by the unholy inhuman because now we've, we've got the juxtaposition inhuman noises in or human noises right. in human screech of the mordicant and then because at this point she thinks she, she, like she's got some time it was past the doorkeeper which was that one and she's like oh shit it's coming for me so immediately so you had the rubber ducky comment and now you have this and you're like oh shit we gotta hustle my guy <laughs> tension tension is back 
Um, and so she has to hop across these stones, which you realize in Abhorson, or uh, yeah, in, no, in Lyriel, they're like almost six feet apart. So it's not like stepping stones that you just walk. She has to leap across to get across this river to get to um, the island where her father's house is, just in the middle of this river. Like this, this, this river is massive, and then there's just an island. Um, and so she has to make the jump. The Mordekin is coming, but it can't cross. Uh, one of the rules in this world is that the dead cannot cross running water, which is actually a very common rule for dead things that you see in mm -hmm. a lot of uh, it, uh, European mythos. Um, in this case, it also makes sense because death is a river, um, yeah. which is not like, you know, that's not a super unique idea. But in, in this case, it works. I, I will say that, like, one of the things I really loved about the magic system as a kid and one thing I really love about it now is that it's tied to such... Um, such specificity in terms of like the bells and the noise of a way to control it it's not like a vague spell it's no it's a very concrete thing and death has like very specific layers to it instead of just being kind of floaty and weird and i think that really helps kind of ground the magic and make it feel a little bit more cool um and and real oh one thing i will say is that i dislike how there's two magic systems. There's the charter magic system and the necromancy system. And I feel like this should have just magic. been. The... Yeah, I don't love the whole free magic thing. I know it becomes a big thing in Lyriel, but like I felt like it's a hat on a hat, as they say. Um, so what it is that I because you get an explanation for this is that the free magic existed first and the charter magic was a bound it, binding and organizing mm -hmm. of the free magic. So it's actually just like a more controlled version of just magic in general um because but then magic... death has this whole other thing to it with rules and like the river and the bells and like i didn't love that um one of the other things that is that's kind of cool is that the bells want to ring and they kind of want to control things and i remember in lyriel that goes really wrong at one point where she tries to uh ring a bell and it like does a thing she didn't expect um which yeah. i always thought was kind of cool it's so good because it, it makes the like these are the tools of an abort of course and trade, but they're tricksy. Some of them, uh, some of them are steady and like chill, and some of them are like, "Shall I walk you to death, little?" I love how like yeah, they have each have their own character too, like the sleeper, the waker, the binder. Um, I just I always loved the bells. I always oh, thought they were just the coolest, so coolest good. thing. Reading this makes me want to do a Sabriel. Um, cosplay like i mm. i saw a really good one uh once that like she made the whole bandolier and it looks super cool i, love uh, it. I wanted to make it into a minifigure but doing that many bells on a figure is is enormously that difficult, sounds so. crazy anyway so she eventually gets to the house the mordicant's still out there uh she gets there she's kind of exhausted um and she's greeted by this white cat who is talking and she's like the fuck are you and it's like i am mogget <laughs> I have, and Tim Curry, this is where I want to shout out old Tim. Uh, he goes so hard on Moggett's voice <laughs> for no goddamn reason. And it is great, and we are blessed by him and his presence. <laughs> because he'll start saying a sentence and get halfway through, and then at the end, have this weird flourishy to it that, like, he didn't need to. Yes, that, exactly that to all of his dialogue. It's wonderful. <laughs> um so and and Mogget is this and she looks at Mogget and immediately is like this is a bound free magic creature because its collar is just basically living charter spells um of binding and she realizes oh this is this was once a powerful free magic creature that has just been bound <laughs> uh and is now a cat <laughs> What are you doing here? And he's like, I have served the Abhorsons for hundreds of years, blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of sendings in this house. And the, the funny thing that you get about the world building and, and seeing all the different sendings and all their different personalities is every Abhorson who has lived in this house has created their own sendings to feel like they're bringing a bit <laughs> of themselves. And there are really old sendings and each sending has a vaguely, like has its own personality based on the spirit the Abhorson is trying to mimic. And it's just, it's great. Um, she takes a bath, she eats, and basically, uh, Mog gets like, oh, by the way, that creature outside, it's building a bridge, and they look out, and the, the Mordekent is, like, hanging back in the shadows during the day, and it has enslaved humans from a nearby village to drag grave dirt all the way up the steps that bring you to this river, and they're stacking boxes of grave dirt to create a path that the Mordekent can cross, and they're like, she's like, because 
um, I have to go like help save my father. And basically what Mogget also tells her is that her dad was heading to Belisere, which is the capital of the kingdom. Um, um, at this point when they're eating, there's a, a, a description I liked because it does show that there's some interiority to Sabriel, if you would do the honors. Sabriel swallowed her last mouthful, all taste gone, and put down her fork. She took a mouthful of wine to clear her throat, but it seemed to have become vinegar, making her cough. See, so there's like a nice, uh, that's a nice bodily description to get you into her feeling. So the author does put in the work in that respect. There was another one right before this description earlier in this dinner that I think was also fantastic, which is she drinks the wine. She has no idea if it's good or not. But as she's gotten older, she's just gotten into the habit of drinking wine with dinner. Yeah. She has no taste. Red wine. <laughs> is it good? She has no clue. But she's she's taken on this affectation of adulthood. And that is such like that is such a 19 year old girl thing to do. You know, it's so um, specific. This is not a default character thing. Yes. Um, Miss Ali Snow says, <laughs> did you see that too? Yeah, I know. I was just going to do it. Undead creatures, you shall not pass. Oh, oops, wait, you found a way to pass. <laughs> I exactly actually, I really like that too, because it shows that their enemy, Karagor, is smart. You know, he knows how to get around this whole, he's not just like, oh, damn, I can't get through. He's going to manipulate people. And it's cruel that he's manipulating and enslaving these people to do that. Yep. And, and as they're getting tired, some of them like fall and get washed down the river. Um, so it's really like an affecting scene. But anyway, uh, they're looking at this and they're like, oh, crap, they're going to get across because the only way for her to uh, and, and they're like, how do they keep this from happening? And Mogget's like, you can flood the river. And she's like, what? And they can call a massive amount of water from these glaciers up on the mountain above. And it'll just completely, it'll raise above the stones. So, and it will wash like the entire bank of the river that all those people in the Mordekin is on. It'll just wash them the flip away. And this would be a way to ensure that like, they can't get across. And she's like, but then how am I going to get out? And he's like, oh, but we have this, one of your ancestors made this like flying contraption. You can take that. And she's like, oh, crap, I have to go to Belisair. I have to fly. I've never flown anything. And it is described as a paper wing. That doesn't sound safe. And now I have to flood this area. And she does it. She she does the spell to flood it. And she knows that this is also going to kill some of the human slaves. And as it happens, some of the human slaves purposefully to get out of the control of the dead creatures jump and go careening down the waterfall. And it's this moment of like, oh God, she has to make real decisions that are going to affect people. And, and you start understanding the severity of what's happening. Because before it was just, her dad was missing and in death. What does that mean for everyone? And now we start seeing the cost of her dad being missing. Death is running amok. It raises the stakes really beautifully. Anyway, so uh, they flood the river, people go careening. And then Mog is like, time to go in the paper wing. Um, and the paper wing is like a canoe with wings and people at it. <laughs> and, and um, basically they go into the air and they fly. And then um, the Flublin from Dublin, um, whatever those crows are called in Lord of the Rings. Um, the Gore Crows. They're called Gore Crows here, but in yeah. the Lord of the Rings, he says they're from Dublin. Um, and so uh, though they attack her, which I thought was really cool. They're one animated spirit and a bunch of crow bodies. Um, oh, they attack so her. The the, the paper wing crashes, and then this is one of the cooler parts of the book. You skipped something. What did I skip? While the paper wing, uh, so she's summoned too much wind. She no longer has control of the wind, and the Gorkros are attacking. And Mogget says, take my collar off. And earlier, as they were about to leave the a Porson's house, um, he throws something up and it's a little ring and he says put it on your finger take it with you you'll know when you need to use it and she's like that's weirdly cryptic and i have <laughs> no idea what that means but she puts it on her finger and they fuck off um so while they're in the the paper ring the gore crows are attacking she is completely lost because wind magic is not something she's practiced a lot she's lost control of the wind they're careening down and he says take my collar off and she's like i feel like this is a bad idea but what else are we gonna do so she takes his collar off and he explodes into this white fiery free magic creature and then like and it starts taking them down um to the place but what they didn't realize is as uh free mogget was taking them down to what they thought was just a landing spot it was a hole <laughs> that they couldn't see because it's <laughs> dark so they like land but they don't land they just plummet down to the bottom of this thing they she crashes she's hurt but this fiery creature is like oh little abhorsen 
you fool. I shall finally kill you. <laughs> and I have been like, bound for years and now I'm free. It's you. so creepy and cool. And she's like, oh, God, I have no idea how to fight this thing. She's freaking out. She's not feeling good. But then she feels the ring on her finger start falling off and it's expanding and suddenly she's holding it and it's a round thing and she's holding it and the creature is coming like to eat her like its mouth opens and it's coming and she just takes the ring which has gotten really big now and she slips it over its head and it starts binding the creature and it's thrashing and it's binding and she's like why isn't it working why isn't he turned into a cat but then she remembers it had um Mogget had a little sarnath uh which is the bell of binding on his collar and so she takes Saranath out of the her bandolier and she rings it and it binds him and it's Mogget again and he's like sorry about that <laughs> and she's like <laughs> god damn it the paper wings crashed they're stuck they go to sleep she wakes up to a very excited Mogget <laughs> he's like mistress I found <laughs> stuff come look what I found and you're he's like bounding around you're like, Mogget, what, what is happening? And she's like, maybe it's now that he's back in the cat form, he's going to be extra catty. And she's like, he's like, I found water. And she is not feeling great. She, you know, she's she's hurt. She's limping her way through to see what he's showing her. Um, and he's like, I found a spring, spring. And it's Tim Curry narrated the heck out of this part. Because you get the idea that Mogget is weirdly giddy. Um, and then she, by the spring, there's a patch of cat grass. And so he was just <laughs> high on cat. <laughs> it's so funny. But anyway, the important thing is in this place, they find these giant ships. And on each of the ships is a mast of like a figure. And she realizes this is the graveyard of the old royals. What they would do is when the royal people would die, they would get interned here in these giant ship bodies, like in these giant ships, and that's where their bodies would stay. And then there's this one ship that was never finished being built. And on its bow, or I don't know, on one part of it is the like instead of one of those figurines it's the carving of a naked young man but eerily beautiful and, and she gets really well embarrassed done. about it which is hilarious she's it's like, like oh british girl she's like i've never seen one of those uncircumcised like in <laughs> <laughs> it's uncircumcised and she's like oh man i haven't <laughs> seen one of those yet because she literally says the only time she's ever seen anything like it was in her anatomy books in mm -hmm. school like very <laughs> funny Anyway, and she looks at it and it's so lifelike. It is so lifelike. She doesn't believe it's carved. And she realizes, I think somebody is in there. And she goes into death and she kind of finds this like body. Well, okay. So what I really like about this is also that she kind of does this just to take control of yes. the situation. Oh. She's like, okay, I don't have to do this, but like, this is a moment where I can take control. I can actually do something productive. And that's something about her character is that like, whenever she's kind of lost, she decides to do something productive, regardless of whether it's necessarily the best idea or not. Um, yeah. And so this is another characterizing moment. Cause she's literally stuck in this thing. She doesn't know how to get out. It's a massive hole. They're now underground in this other area. They, she doesn't know how to get out. She, she doesn't want to waste time and rescuing this guy would definitely be a waste of time, but it's an objectively good thing she can do somebody is stuck in there somebody has been bound and it's an objectively good it's not gray it's not white like or black and white it, it's it's uh, or no it's absolutely white it's not like in the middle she can mm -hmm. just do this good thing and it'll be a net positive very quickly uh maximilian says that's just our art good artisan woodworking skill specifically on the penis <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's some Michelangelo stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so she goes into death. She finds this uh, spirit encased in like a block of ice and she pulls it. But as she pulls it, other dead things like it, it had a string on it and it's let other dead know. So she has to like run out. She brings the body in. The At first, she like comes out of death with the, the spirit and the wood wooden guy is just still wood and she's like what's happening and then she hears like groaning and stuff and like this guy burst forth kind of screaming freaking out and he passes out and she's like yo that was rough and he's also you know naked and so she's like i wonder if he'll fit in my pants <laughs> like, <laughs> here's a shirt and mom gets like yeah let him sleep so she goes off to shower and while she's off this man awakes and he can't fully remember who he is or what happened, but he has memories of a terrible thing that happened right before he died. And he's talking to, Mogget appears and is talking to him. And what you get throughout the book, Mogget has been unable to speak of a specific thing. And Mogget is talking to this guy and you realize they both can't fully tell you what happened 
to this character because he can't fully speak about it and Mogget can't fully speak about it. So whatever the great thing that they are magic from speaking about has to do with what happened to touch between before this guy died. Um, but what you do get, because Mogget basically is like, do you remember what you did? And he's like, oh crap, I do remember what I did. It was terrible. And I am a terrible person. What is it like? I do not deserve, why am I here? Blah, blah, blah. It's also been 200 years since this guy like was put into this wooden thing. Um, and eventually Mogget's like, what's your name? And he's like, I don't remember my name. And frankly, that's fine. I don't deserve the name I used to have. And so he's like, the guy's like, he reached out and he touched this stone because he needed to ground himself in something physically. And Mogget's like, I'm going to call you Touchstone. And Touchstone's like, that's a dumb name. That's a jester's name. That's the name of an idiot. And Mogget's like, you don't have anything better? And it's fitting. And he looks down and he sees his hand <laughs> touching a stone. And he's like, I guess so. And so what you get is that something very traumatic happened to this guy that he is not proud of, that he very, it very much weighs on him. Eventually, uh, Sabriel comes, uh, Sabriel comes back from the bath, uh, and she's all clean and stuff. And she's talking to him and she's getting really fucking annoyed because this guy is affecting to be a servant. And what you got from the situation with Mogget was this guy was not a servant. This guy was someone of higher standing. And she can tell that he is affecting this servile tone and she, it's pissing her off. Cause she like. What's also hilarious about it is that like, she really just wanted someone to talk to who was normal and he's not being a normal person. And it's so annoying to her. Cause she's like, well, why did I even bring you back then? <laughs> and it's like, it's that kind of, um, not enemies to lovers trope or whatever, but it's like a little bit of that friction, but it feels kind of organic to her character that like, oh, she just wanted a normal person to talk to who wasn't Mogget and he's not doing it. And so she gets annoyed. Cause she tries and she's to run doing the survival thing. And she's trying to run ideas by him. And he's like, that sounds good. Uh, and cause he calls her Abhorson and she's like, I am not Abhorson. My father is Abhorson. My name's Sabriel. But like everybody keeps calling her that because if your dad's in dead, I'm sorry, girl, you're Abhorson. Um, and she, what she didn't realize was that was a title. Like she had no idea that that wasn't her dad's <laughs> name and it was a fucking title. And now she's Abhorson. Um, and he, if he doesn't call her Abhorson, he calls her mistress because as the Abhorson, it's a very high uh, position. And she's like, don't call me mistress. I am Sabrio. Um, and uh, they, it's hysterical. But she wants someone to run her ideas by and get feedback. And he's not giving her anything. And in, in a lot of cases, she just he just doesn't remember stuff. And it just it's so funny watching them talk. <laughs> Uh, and, and have these interactions. But eventually he does remember enough about how to get out of this particular area. So they like swoop out these hidden stairs. Um, and uh, he like tries walking in front of her. And what she realizes at a certain point is he's actually a very powerful charter mage, not just like, like a little baby, like a very competent charter mage. Cause she just assumed because number one, he's called Touchstone and that's a dummy's name. And because he's acting like an absolute, like, servile dummy for no reason that he was just an idiot um <laughs> and so in the moments where he is competent she's like why are you acting like this it's like why are you pretending to be dumb i don't get this um but they need to go to balisar and they find like a way to get there and i'm gonna skip past a couple of things that happen because they're not super like impactful of the plot mm -hmm. Um, but eventually they get to Belisar. By this point, he has come out of his shell a little bit. And um, he gave like an origin story to himself that was a lie when they first met. Um, and while they're traveling to Belisar, they're on the ocean. They have to sail. Um, and while they're on the ocean, suddenly Mogget and uh, Touchstone can talk about the thing because the water is so big. The ocean is so powerful. It negates uh, magic. And so they're able to talk about it. And what you discover is that Touchstone was a very, very, very good friend of this guy named Prince Roger. Uh, Roger was super charismatic um, and chill, but he kind of like went a little bit off the deep end and he was gone for a few years. And uh, Touchstone was like the head of the guard. Like he was in the like Royal Guard, super high position. Um, and Roger uh, comes back after a time and he like hangs out and he's super, he's more charismatic. He's healthier than he's been in ages. Everybody's so happy. They've got the old Roger back. He's not being like a creepy weirdo anymore. Um, and he's hanging out with uh, Touchstone and he convinces uh he's like let's go see my mom and touchstone's like yeah let's go see your mom and his mom obviously is the queen 
Um, and he, Roger tells the queen and his sisters that something terrible is happening in this underground part of Bella, the Bellisere castle, um, where the great charter stones are. The great charter stones were built by this original like group of people, um, the wall makers, the Aporsons, the royal line, and the Clare. Um, this group came together and built these giant charter stones to kind of bind magic and allow people to use it. And they're literally underneath the um, the ground uh, of this castle. And he's like, "Oh, something terrible is happening. We have to go down there." And the queen's like, "No, nah, I don't. I don't really think we should. That doesn't sound like something we should." But Roger is like, touchstone, like, back me up here, guy. And Touchstone, who loves his friend and who is, like, super, he, he's seeing the good in him, is like, yeah, let's go down. And then Roger takes them all down, slays the queen upon the great charter stone and breaks it. Fucks it up. And then kills all of his sisters. And Touchstone's like, oh, shit. And he literally goes insane. The next thing he remembers is waking up when Lyria, uh, when Sabriel, uh, woke him up off the ship. Um, and so what this did is it threw the entire kingdom into chaos because there was no longer a royal line. Everyone is dead. Um, and uh, the magic of the uh, entire kingdom has been weakened because one of the greater charter stones has been demolished. Um, you also get that Mogget and Touchstone met each other once way back in the day, but Mogget did not look like current Mogget. <laughs> um, which is great. It's a lovely tidbit for later. But anyway, um, and... So what you find out is that Roger is Caragor. Yeah, because um, Caragor and... was his childhood nickname. Yeah, which is hilarious. But also, I hate it. So, I don't hate it. I, I don't like it. The thing I that like Maria it. has said about me, and again, it's weird how your friends sometimes know you better than yourself, is that I like villains to either be elemental forces of dread of eldritch horror, or I like them to be super personal to the um, the char the the main character. So either abusive parent or Cthulhu. And like I don't really like the in between. So Caragor to me was so creepy. And then we find out that he has a backstory. And I liked the idea much more that he was like just some strange necromancer who had stayed in death so long and had been so like tenuously connected to it. Oh, um, but see, I disagree. I love the idea that he was because what you also realize is that when he went back and was visiting, uh, when he killed the queen and everything, he was already dead. He had crafted a body of flesh for himself uh, to... Uh, come and do this and I love the idea of a prince of the realm who literally has the great because the only way to break a greater charter stone is to have one of those four families blood spilt upon it um and he literally is of one of those families and somehow got sucked into like and and uh, intoxicated by the power of necromancy and he not only is he a dead spirit he is one of the greater dead like there is nothing a mordicant is nothing to this guy um and i like that and i like the idea of that him literally slaughtering his mothers and sisters to break this and, and just send the realm into chaos it, it is for me way more engaging than just I came out as a shithead, you know? Well, I didn't even want any backstory for him. I just wanted, like, the weird creepiness of this elemental creature. But again, that's sort of just a... Yeah. A that's why literally the, the backstory came and I was like, oh, Will's not Will's not going to like this. <laughs> it reminded me of Uprooted where like I liked it so much more before we figured out who the queen was and that we just yes. all needed to be friends to fix the problems of the world. Yep. Um, anyway, so they get to Belisair and Belisair is fucked. Like the regent died 200 or uh, like uh, 20 or 50 years ago. Like it's been a while since there even was a regent in control of everything. And basically how the city works is there's a portion of the city that is in completely encased in these aqueducts of water so the dead can't get in um and at night at a certain time these bells ring letting everybody know you need to go inside these areas um and they get to the city and it's lined like like it's it's rough there's a lot of ruffians it's it's not doing great but they they go to this inn and i'm going to mention the scene because a lot of a lot of stuff has been happening. I skipped a whole scene on an island where they banished mm -hmm. this dead creature. And so Sabriel and Touchstone, who argue a lot. There was a hilarious part about the island, though, because when they're coming in to introduce themselves, he says, Touchstone says, like, oh, I'm her sworn sword. And she's like, 
that was weird. Why'd you do that? And I'm he's like, like, you're not my sword sword. Mm. And he's like, well, the other thing they would think is that I'm your lover. And uh, and she's like, and, oh, oops. And she's like, oh, no, I didn't even think about the I fact that I'm an unmarried woman traveling with a man. And this place <laughs> is way more socially conservative than even Anselcier, where that still would have been weird. And it's just great. He was like, I, I picked the thing that was the best. It makes sense for the abortion to have. Yeah, a sworn sword. Um, but anyway, so uh, they, they've been bonding. And again, they butt heads because like there are moments where he's competent and and he like shows his like he, he's a great fighter. He knows shit. He's, he's got a lot of knowledge. And then there's these other times where he'll be like, yes, mistress, can I get you your wood to, for, to burn your fire? I'll cook <laughs> the food. And she's like, I hate it stop it and it's just it's so great but what also happens is as like she sees the more competent parts of him she's like he's not like really conventionally attractive but there's something you know there's there's something there she's already seen and, the good too yeah and she's seen the goods like uh so <laughs> they get to this inn and there's this great scene where she's taking a bath and she thinks she knows touchstone's room is next to hers uh and she hears the servant who like got her bath water ready goes into the room next to hers that she assumes is touchstones um and starts filling the bath and she hears a male laughing and then she hears the servant laughing and there's giggling and all of a sudden there's a lot of splashing if you'll if you if you know what i mean and she hears the grunting and noises and she she like just sinks her head underneath the water because <laughs> she's like she's hearing this and she's like i don't like this and then she like comes up and the water is pouring down her face so you can't see she's crying and Moggett's just sitting there going touchstones downstairs in the tavern waiting for you to finish your back bath uh his room is that one <laughs> not that one and she's like oh shit I just got jealous and emotional for no goddamn reason. And like, also, bitch, what part of his touchstone up to this point would make you think he would sleep with one of the workers in the tavern? Like, calm down. You it's, 19 very, it, it's hilarious, but it's also very cute. It's like it, one of the ways that it's like a slow burn. And you, me and Maria obviously have such such a weakness for slow burns. And it's also just such a 19 year old yeah, girl thing true. to do. Like, and just mm. dunk your head under mm. the water like and it's not like you know how uh in a lot of ya the the main character like lays back and then they let themselves sink under the water dramatically no this is literally <laughs> like like a little kid being like, eh, mm. and it just mwah, mwah. anyway it wasn't That's touchstone great. everything's um, good quickly celia says uh having to work and only be able to follow separate parts is hilarious it goes from flying canoe to prince of death the whiplash i'm experiencing it's real <laughs> true don't worry true. And now we just got to a uh, bath part, so yeah, <laughs> it'll you know. get worse. Um, anyway, so they know they need to go to the underground area where the Great Charter Stone's in. Is They have a really good idea that that's where his, her dad's body is. Because Sabriel knows her dad is alive. He's not fully dead. Um, but they need to find his body. But she also knows at this point, it has taken them so long to get there. There is no way to fully bring her ba dad back to life. And she's avoiding thinking of that because she doesn't want to face that reality of her dad is dead. But she also needs her father because she has no idea what the fuck to do with Karagor. Um, so they have to go into the uh, part of the city that is outside of the aqueducts and go into the old burnt down remains of the castle. Uh, and as they do, they see these like guys who are like... Uh, what was the term? Pillagers? Not pillagers. Raiders. Raiders. Like they're they're going into the old parts of the city, which were abandoned very quickly to find wealth and goods. But what they do is they bring children in to use the children to distract the dead. And their goal, uh, Sabriel touched on Moggett's goal, is to go in when it's full daylight before it gets too dark uh, to get in and get out. Um, and Sabriel wants to save these children. But she knows she does not have time to do that and go get her father. And, like, eventually Maga and Touchstone have to be like, listen, unfortunately, there is a greater good decision than needs. Because, like, without your dad, everyone here is fucked. Like, we just got to hustle, my girl. And so they go in. They find her dad. And she has to go into death to pull her dad's spirit back. And he is, like, locked behind, like, the fourth or fifth gate. Like, he's, he's pretty deep in. Um, and Touchstone and Mocket are left to take care of her body, which they've, they've put them in a diamond of protection, uh, and Touchstone helps her with this. Like, it, there's a, a, quite a few times when they have, um, 
she has to do charter magic he'll touch her and give lend her some of her strength his strength and that's how she knows like this this guy got mad power but anyway um also he's having a lot of ptsd because uh this is the place that the terrible thing that literally broke his mind happened um and he's very scared of Caragor, and there's very much the idea of this foreboding building tension happening. She goes into death, she finds her papa, um, and they're having a conversation, and he's like, man, we have to get back, like, because he realizes, like, um, you're in the the place, oh, we gotta get you out of there, he's gonna come and he's gonna try to use your body's blood to break another charter stone um it's a good thing the prince who's the only other person that could be used to break a charter stone is still uh <laughs> trapped in that wooden ship uh, and can't be used you know few to that and she's like um um uh what what do you mean a prince trapped in a wood on a boat and she was like um... yeah the half the the half uh the bastard son of the queen uh, uh his like he he was there when all that shit we we he was really crazy. So they just locked him up in some wood uh, for safekeeping, you know, eventually. And she's like, um, well, I released that guy. Oh, and the other thing you find out is the other way to break a charter stone is to use one of the great uh, creations of the wall makers. That's Mogget. <laughs> Mogget is a creation and a binding that the wall makers did. And the wall makers were basically the art, the great magic artificers of this world. They created the wall that keeps the old kingdom and the uh, and Celestia are separate. They created um, the sword that the Obhorsen uses, which is a super fancy uh, chartered sword. Um, and so now, not only is she there with blood that can break a charter stone, and Touchstone is there with blood that can break a charter stone, but so is Mogget. <laughs> like, Caragor has a smorgasbord. He can break multiple stones, and her dad is like, we gotta get the fuck out of here. And she's kind of upset because she's been trying to save her dad and get to him. And she's she in this moment is a little girl that just wants her dad to hug her and and like be a parent. This and, was such a great character moment because even as they're like striding back towards life, she's like a little really grumpy fast. about it. And like, why didn't you tell me this? What's going on? She's like a little plaintive about it. And there's a part where her father stops and like hugs her and is like, I love you, but we got to keep going through this. I'm sorry I wasn't this able is, to tell you more. I've only got 100 heartbeats to live. Yeah, because that's what he says. I only have 100, 100 heartbeats. So like a 1,000 heartbeats that once he's back in the world of the living that he can stay alive for. I was bad at to... math, so I couldn't figure out how long that was. I was like, is that years? Is that days? What does that mean? Um, so <laughs> It's a set amount of time that he can be alive for before he has to get yeeted back to death. And and it's just, and he's like, this is the nature. He's like, I, I wish I could have been a better parent. And I wasn't because I was so absent. And it's just this lovely little scene and you're sad for her. They bust back in. While they've been in death, uh, Touchstone's freaking out because there's a lot of dead. And not only are the dead coming, but they're like chanting and like, and they're, they're creating <laughs> a path. This was so creepy. Yeah, they're coming down in a path down the steps. And she go, he goes, oh, yeah, this is Caragor for sure. That son of a bitch had a flair for the dramatic. So Caragor is literally so sending a bunch of dead hands in to create a path that he can walk down. Like, <laughs> I'm here. Um, and then he comes and he's misshapen because he had to make this body really quickly. And ideally, he would have liked no one to see this because Caragor is also vain as heck. Um, and it's this like amalgamation of body parts that kind of look like Caragor, but nothing is exactly right. And they're coming down, uh, he's coming down the steps and he's like, oh, hello, brother. And uh, Touchstone is like, Caragor, uh, Roger. Um, but uh, then, uh, you know, the Oporson and Sabriel come back in. Cause like, Touchstone's like, Sabriel, you gotta wake the fuck up, girl. <laughs> like, please get up. Um, and they, they fly back in and it's kind of a mad dash of figuring out stuff. Well, but then all of a sudden, well, what happens is the Abhorsen goes, I think when they're still in death, he's like, give me your sword and give me one of the bells. Because yeah. he's like, he's a badass. And he's like, meets up with Caragor and is like, and nope. Immediately. Ah, like, go yeah. at it. Um, but what he does is he uses the last bell, the walker. Not the, not the last one, but one of the bells. I think that's the second to last. It's the walker. And it walks spirits into death. And he rings it fucking hard. So hard that Touchstone starts walking uh, and she's like, no, 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 stay here. Look at me, buddy. Don't walk in. He's like, because like Touchstone has a lot of like, tra like trauma things yeah. and, and things that he's dealing with. And he's like, 
this sounds delightful because the walking tune is like a Jake, like, do, 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 come on this way. <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 I need you to focus. So she kisses him and it's this big dramatic kiss. But while that bell is going, she knows her father is walking into death. So he wasn't even there for as long as he could have been. They don't mm. have a moment in life to be father and daughter. And it just, oh, uh, anyway, and, and then they're gone. The spirits are gone of the dead. He walked them all into death. But what they know is, as much as Caragor's spirit, because her dad told her, Caragor's body has been missing. He's technically kind of alive. His body is in this uh, place of stasis. We don't know where it is. We haven't known for the past 200 years. But the Claire have figured it out. And I'm pretty sure it's a cross in Ancelstier. And he's like, that's one of the reasons why I kind of sent you there. They told me you needed to go grow up there. They didn't know why at the time, but I'm pretty sure it's because his body is somewhere on the other side of the wall. Like he made a smart decision and hit himself over there. And he's like, until you destroy his body and then banish him back to death, Caragor will always be able to come back. Always. And she's like, oh, God damn it. So they immediately are like, we have to get to um, this other area. Like we have to get back to the wall, which is very far away. And her dad had told her there are some paper wings in this one area of the castle. You need to go there. There are some Claire waiting for you that are going to give you more information. And she's like, oh, shit. So um, and he's like, he's like, I don't know who it'll be, but I know the Claire will probably know what's going up. And they're probably waiting for you because they're the Claire and the Claire are the fortune tellers. They're, they're the seers of this world. Um, and so Touchstone and her have to run. They're exhausted. That was a really traumatic experience that they just went through. And they're like running. And Touchstone goes kind of berserk. Like there's this point where things are attacking and he just like white hot charter rages so much that she is scared that he is going to like kill himself in panic. And um, eventually like as they get to the claire and the uh paper wings he passes out so she talks to the claire and they're like yeah his body is in uh an ancestor we want to show you the vision we had and they show her that he's in this mound that she knows it's literally like 30 miles like not even like 10 miles away from the school she she went to school at his body has was right where she lived basically her whole life um and uh they have to get there and the claire are like okay we got you a paper wing it's uh red and gold because you know he's he's the king and she's like holy shit touchstone's not just the prince he's the fucking king um so he's calmed down <laughs> he comes down off well of what's brain. hilarious is that like he wasn't even really hiding that he was a bastard son he just didn't tell her like yeah. it wasn't like he was like oh it's the secret identity he just didn't mention it because yeah. he was like oh whatever it's fine because yeah, in his world he wasn't a prince right he, he just was the bastard son of the queen and his identity was just never spoken about um the other thing so, is by now they're missing mogget because mogget uh stayed behind with, when, with, yeah so when she the thinks bell mogget, got she also thinks mogget has been wrung into death and like not only did she lose her dad but she had this cat companion that had been with her uh this whole time and so she's kind of sad about that but they fly to the wall as they're flying to the wall the people on the the guard posts on the Ancelstier side are like, uh, there's an aircraft. And they're like, oh, it's coming <laughs> in from our side. And they're like, no, 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 it's coming from the old kingdom. And they're like, oh, no, that's that's a little weird. <laughs> Things don't fly over there. That's magic shit. That's magic. And so uh, they, they, they got their binoculars and they're looking and they see Sabriel pop out. And that old general guy's like, that looks like Sabriel, but I'm not sure if it's her. Uh, and eventually once they establish that, hey, this is Sabriel, they, she basically tells them, I'm going to need some of your charter mages. She's like, this dead creature is going to come. It knows I'm now going after its body. It will come uh, and invade this land. You have to help us. And and um, I think that the flutes at this point have broken or are going to break before yeah. he gets there, I think is what it is. And what's interesting is she's like, you need to help me do this. And then you need to not fight the dead as they pass through the wall because it will be pointless. You will yeah. just die. They will mostly ignore you if you don't do anything. And this is the start of basically the dread that's going to lead up to the very end of the book where you're like, Caragor is coming. There's nothing to stop him. With an army of dead. With an army of dead and just the dread starts to build and the tension starts to build here. And you also figure out that the captain is a bit of a charter mage and he knows the moment of his death or something like that. And he's like known that. it for years. He has had a dream of his death. And there's this point where like, he walks away because he's like, I can't leave my post. Like, I can send you with a bunch of my charter mages, but I can't leave my post. And she's like, no, please come. And he comes back and he goes, 
like uh, something about a dream he had and facing the, the moment. And you realize in that moment, he's going to die. Like, because mm-hmm. he doesn't state it explicitly, but you're like, oh man, this guy knows he's he's going to die. He knows that this, and she realizes there must be some clear, like seer blood. He has the power of sight because she noticed, she knows that the dream he's talking about is a prophetic one. Uh, so they have to travel to where the, the thing is. They dig it up. It is this heavy, heavy casket. And as they're digging it up, it's polluted by free magic, which makes everyone in the area kind of sick. And it's super heavy and they can't, they try open it there, um, but they don't have enough charger mages to do it. Like nobody is powerful enough with, uh, S- Sabriel is the one doing the spell. Everybody's in a circle around her touching her. So like all, not enough. And then she's like, shit, where are we going to find some more charter mages? And then what I didn't mention before is at her school, she was taught charter magic. There was a magistrix, which is the magic teacher at her school. Um, so all the kids who had the charter were taught magic. And she realizes there's like 30 girls who know charter magic who we can use. And so they were like, we need to, and there's no, there's not enough time to get there, tell them to come and get them there. They realize we need to go to Wyverly College. And it's like 10 miles away and they have to like horse and buggy it. Um, but uh, And I, uh, I really love this whole thing about them basically needing the schoolgirls because they knew magic. Like, it's just such like, a, we got the soldiers and they're good fighters and they know magic, but like, no, we got to call on the school. Like, it's a nice like reversal. Yeah. And it's also like a nice planted gun of like, we knew this beforehand. So this whole book, we've gone away from Wyverly and now we're coming back. Coming so all back that work it. done at the beginning kind of paid off. And um, the, the general's like, is it, is it a good building is it fortified and she's like oh yeah it's a way better defense position than where we are now so they bust into the school she comes in and the head of the school is like who may i speak to what is the meaning of this i am friends with uh colonel general so and so and then sabriel pops up and she's like hey um and the teacher's like what are you doing and she's like uh the dead are gonna invade we need to get some shit done where is madristrix um uh Greenwood um and eventually like so she calms everybody down she finds my district Greenwood and she's like hey I need you and I need all of the magic girls uh to come help us there is the dead uh, and Magistrix Greenwood looks at her realizes because uh the symbol of the of Corson is green or silver keys on a blue background and that's the surcoat that Sabriel is wearing and she sees her with the bells and the sword and she doesn't call her Sabriel she calls her a person because she knows the position and so immediately Majestic Screenwood is on board they take the casket into the auditorium they get all of the girls who've been trained in charter magic and everybody's standing around and they're trying to like do this and they hear because like as they've been traveling through this world um uh, and trying to get to the school, they've no, they've heard bells ringing, saying that something is crossing the wall. And as the bells continue to ring closer and closer, they know Caragor and his uh, creatures are coming across. Because even though it's daylight, it's kind of cloudy, and they're using a magically summoned fog. Um, and wind is coming from across the northern side to kind of get across, even though it's still kind of daylight. So at the school, they're building up defenses, um, preparing things. But there was this dread like stuff isn't happening fast enough they don't have enough time to get into the casket and then all of a sudden while all the girls are getting ready to cast this spell um and they like open it there's a giant crash through the wall and the giant white fire spirit that was mogget from earlier busts in well okay so before that though there was a couple parts i wanted to highlight so again they're throughout like the whole chapter of them going to the tomb they keep thinking like okay there's the dark is coming in we hear the bells and then they go back to the um the school and they're like picket guns that are firing as these dead hands are coming and then but the first wave of them die but they're like okay caragor is going to keep coming and then i had forgotten to write this down as a quote but i'm going to send it to you on facebook because i want you to read it out because this is like one of my favorite parts of the whole book um uh, oh yes this was great oh this is the best part because she's going back they you know the picket guns are firing and then these are like the veterans yeah so there were more soldiers in the corridor but these were mailed and helmed with large shields and broad-headed spears streaked with silver and the simplest charter marks drawn in chalk and spit they were smoking and drinking tea from the school's second best china sabriel realized they were there to fight when the guns failed There was an air of controlled nervousness about them, not bravado exactly, just a strained mixture of competence and cynicism. 
Whatever it was, it made Sabriel walk casually among them, as if she was in no hurry at all. Evening, miss. Good to hear the guns, hey? Practically never work up north. Won't need us at this rate. Not like at the perimeter, is it, ma'am? Good luck with the bloke in the metal cigar case, miss. Good luck to you all, replied Sabriel, trying to smile in answer to their grins. The firing started again, and she went, losing the smile, but their attention was off her, focused back outside. They weren't nearly as casual as they pretended, Sabriel thought, as she edged through the side doors leading from the corridor to the Great Hall. I love that scene so much. It's it so builds beautiful. the tension so much. You can get the sense that they're waiting. These are tough guys, but they know what's coming is not good. Um, it's one of the ways that, again, the book is distant, but you do get this emotion. I mean, we were reading another book at the same time, um, and the climax of that is nowhere near as good as this one. The climax of this book is... <laughs> <laughs> Maria's patented double chin look of uh oh, not that good. Um, it was such this was such a great climax. I was like, I, I loved this part of the book. Yeah. And again, it goes to show, you know, the writing that's involved. Uh, once we finish more with the plotting, and actually, uh, I have a couple of prose parts that I want to show you guys. But yeah, so they get to the cigar case, the guy in the cigar case. Um, <laughs> they're breaking, they're trying to get the body out, and then Moggett shows up. This Just creature of horrible bust. light. And like explodes through. Uh, and, and all those veterans who were, we just saw a minute ago, they're like, they're now broken. They're in retreat. They're falling back. And like you get, because you had that moment of them being tough, this is a real impact of like, oh shit. And and not just that, but when Moggett exploded through, it sent a shard through Magistrix Greenwood. Her magic teacher, a bunch of, some of the girls are dead. Some of the soldiers that were standing around are just dead by virtue of being, and, and also poor Touchstone has now had like a piece of wood went through his leg, so he's not doing as great. So uh, they're trying, like while she's dealing with this magic thing, they finally get the, the thing open. Um, and uh, like Margaret is there, but then Karagor comes in and Margaret sees Karagor and it's kind of like little mini kaiju battle where it's the white flaming <laughs> light of Margaret and uh, the, the black... Spear. Well, what happens is Moggett wants to be the one to kill the Abhorsen, and Karagor is like, no, it's my job, and so Moggett just throws himself at him. Yeah, he's like, no, you're not going to get this, and they, and they fight, but then Karagor chokes eats. up Moggett and eats him, and now it's just this big thing that ate Moggett, and she's like, oh, crap. And so she's freaking out. She doesn't know what to do. And in a last ditch effort, she, um, I forgot what spell she uses or if it's one of the bells. Oh, because also she's down a bell. She doesn't uh, have. She doesn't have her sword either. Yeah, because her dad had them. Oh, Moggett brought the sword. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. That, the Aporsen obviously sent with a binding, uh, and so now she doesn't have Saranath, uh, sent uh, Moggett to deliver the sword, but it was free Moggett. So he delivers the sword, and he's like, I did my thing, now I'm going to kill you. Um, so <laughs> she now has her sword, and uh, she uses Saranath and another thing to try get a bunch of the dead gone and to get Karagor gone and she uses them but then they burn this is what happens I forgot it, it's uh I think it was Saraneth and the walker one and they just like disintegrate in her hands because Karagor's so powerful but what she does manage to do is she doesn't banish him back to death but he goes into his physical body and like so all of a sudden Karagor pops out of the coffin like hey bitch is what's up but he's still powerful it's all like power inside him um, and he grabs like, and she's trying to fight him with her sword. And what you get in this moment is she is too weak. She does not have the power. He is grossly overpowered in comparison to her. She is not capable. Especially because he ate Moggett. So now he has yes. all of Moggett's power too. And he's holding her and she can't shake him off or get him off of her. And it's got her sword hand. But in her other hand, she suddenly feels the ring on her finger getting loose. And she looks and she sees the spark of Moggett in Karagor's eyes. Um, and uh, she gets the, it's her other hand is behind her back and she kind of gets it. So she's now holding the ring. And um, I forgot if it's her or it's been a minute. I've, I've read a couple books in between this now. Um, but he, she gets him to let go of her enough that he like steps back for a second. Oh no, he's going to cast something. Like he's going to do something to her. So he has to let go. Um, and in that moment, she takes the ring and she just pops it over him. 
and it starts constricting. He starts screaming, but he's like still like coring an apple. I think is the way it was yeah. described. Yeah, because the it's body just shredding the everything. Physical that's not body fitting. just starts like decomposing and just falling off in chunks. Because he also once he was back in his body, he was basically burning through. Because his body's kind of dead; it was just held in this like kind of stasis. But now that he's back in it, it's falling apart. And then once she puts this on him, it's just like, oh. and then all you get is like the black of his spirit. And then his body is just sloughing off. And then it turns into this big bright light and it separates into two spheres. One is white uh, and bright. And then the one is black and it's got the, the rings are connected like this. And then all of a sudden they pop separately and she realizes she needs to bind them. But Sarah the binder one is gone. So she can't do that. She's like, what the, f-? and she's like, at this point, she's about to pass out. She doesn't know what to do. And you're like, holy shit, how is she going to do this? So she takes Rana, which is a bell. It's the tiniest, littlest little one, and it's the sleeper, and it puts things to sleep. And she rings Rana, and the cats, suddenly there are two cats, a black one with this silver collar with a little bell, and a white one with a little collar with a silver bell, and both cats fall asleep, and she passes out. And Touchstone, who is wounded, but not like dead or anything, um, comes to her and is holding her and is calling her name and she is dying she is literally dying she realizes she's in death and she's like you know what fuck it i'm gonna let the river take i did it i bound karagor what else do they need me for it's fine i it's it's all good and she starts like floating down the river and then her dad kind of as a spirit is there and all of the other abhorsons throughout history are there and they're like no it's not your time you don't have a um come back when you have a fucking successor <laughs> basically but they're like no 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 you got to go back go back down the river and she has to drag herself and they they help her they help carry her back down the river and i was like i read this kind of <laughs> sunday evening or monday morning after we had to put down my little adorable baby Aww. boy jasper and so i'm just sobbing because like i'm way too close to like something I care about that and I'm just like crying and they're sending her back I'm like oh Sabriel it's not your time <laughs> like and again I've read this book this wasn't a first um but anyway and she wakes up and Touchstone is like crying over her. oh I forgot to mention something I skipped it <laughs> we skipped it Will neither which part when they're in the oh we'll talk about that in a little bit because actually yeah we can talk about it afterwards yeah anyway and he was like come back and like uh and then she wakes up and they're like both so relieved um it's like almost no falling action i thought there was going to be more but it's like she's dead she's alive and then the book ends pretty much yeah and she like you don't get to see mogget anymore which i was sad about i wanted him to talk like a little bit but he's like asleep a cat and basically, uh, there's some, like, basic fallout. But ba- she comes back. She decides she's going to be the abortion. She's going to do her job, take her thing, like, thing. She's she's going to hang out with uh, Touchstone. And that's how the book ends. That's it. Yeah, I really liked it. So the parts that we didn't talk about is that throughout the whole sequence of them from the bunker to the end of the book, her and Touchstone are like, they touch pinkies at one point or something when they're sitting I in the like same that. car. I like yeah, that. Yeah, it's cute. Like, they get a little bit closer. There's like a real sense of like, okay, the end is coming, but we're like, I trust you and you trust me and it's really and sweet. I, and I like being around you and there's comfort. But I loved it so much. Unfortunately, and then... Nyx ruins it because you get like, again, those small little comforting moments mm-hmm. and them being like into each other and you're like, oh, look at the two of you. But then they're like in this like car thing and uh they're sitting next to each other and he's like i love you and i would like to spend my life with you and she's like i think i love you as well and i'm like bitch you guys have known (laughs) each other for five days can we why are we using can it why can't it be like i'm kind of into you or even just don't say it just don't say anything i i i get like no even inwardly i think he thinks like oh i love her and then he says it if he had just thought it that's fine too but don't say the actual saying of it is like too like ugh. And then her no. saying it back, but because he looks at her and he realizes, oh shit, I have so much emotion. Like, because he's like, because now her bruising in her face, she was a little fucked up from before, previous things have gone down, and she's mm-hmm. like, wow, she's actually pretty. And he's also like, but that didn't matter. I well, I was, also he, he sees into, her as the abhorse and like, that strength is also what he kind of like, and like, that is a comment he makes. She, she seems really young when he first meets her, but she has become very sure of herself. She's really come into her own, which you know is always a, a growth I love because she goes for because even her teacher is like, 
you're not Sabriel anymore your ab horse and like she has come into herself mm -hmm. she started this book as like a 19 year old and now she's carrying this great helm of responsibility and when she comes back to actually there's a point where she's looking at the other students and again i think this kind of is where it hurts that she doesn't actually know any of the students but like they see her differently now and she kind of wishes she could go back to that but she can't now she's the ab yeah. horse and, um there's actually also another really nice part with the students where she's facing caragor and she's like out of it she's completely gone and one of the girls who's dying on the floor touches her hand and gives her her power and i just love that like moment of bravery from you know a schoolgirl, which is not who you you would stereotypically think of as being strong um yeah. and it's one of the ways that i think garth nix is always again i noticed this a lot more as a kid he's very um female positive in terms of his character he reminds me of miyazaki where it's never over I, god i hate mentioning this in front of you because you always act like an absolute ass about it i was um, trying to figure out how to fit in a sesame nope, street reference no nope. <laughs> shut up but in a lot of miyazaki and <laughs> sorry <laughs> i was like I'm which, I, I'm which sesame street off. character can i come up with reference i saw you doing it <laughs> and i regretted bringing it up but it's true <laughs> The way I actually kind of know what you're talking about, but yeah, go ahead. The way he presents is not a, I, the, the characters are never like, I don't need you. I'm, I'm a strong, like, you know, it's never girl boss energy. They are just quietly themselves and they just are like the, the movie never needs to be like, this is a girl boss feminist thing. Uh, <laughs> Well, and their normalcy is something they draw strength from, strength from. And, and is is validated by the narrative. And so in this way, uh, again, I think there's, a, again, the, the fact that they're like, we need more charter mages. Schoolgirls, we got to go back to the school. Like, it's such a great. Like, and everybody's like, yeah, what you expected. <laughs> those are um, the nearest charter mages. So I just love this book so much. Um, one of the things we didn't mention is just how beautifully written it is. It and really is. I have quotes. So I'm going to have Maria read these. Um, one of the things I noticed is that I was looking for one specific description that had to do with the sun, and I couldn't find it, so I did a word search. And what I found is there were three. You only need to read the first one of these, but he describes the sun rising in like three different ways um, that are all really pretty and help enforce the feeling he's trying to go for at the moment. So if you want to read the top one. Okay. Half a mile on, she slowed and stopped to look up at Cloven Crest again. Neck cricked back to watch where the sun struck between the clouds, lighting up the yellow-red granite of the bluffs. And then he does it like three more times. And one of the yeah. things I struggle with my writing is coming up with like new ways to describe the same thing over and over again. Like the dying sun, the falling sun. It's like, okay, can you... Well, it's and one if, of the reasons I don't write more is I get tired of my own writing in that way. And if you um, rewatch this video, you can pause and read all three quotes for your reference. Um, but he really is masterful one in more. his... Okay, go, go. One go. more. Uh, this is where Listen. two I thought was very pretty. The air was calm, but now she saw the clouds. Sabriel recognized it was the calm before heavy rain. The sun would not be guarding them for very much longer, and night would be an early guest. There had been too much death and too much charter magic on this hill, and the night was yet to reach its blackest. The wind was swinging around, the clouds regaining their superiority over the sky. Soon the stars would disappear, and the young moon would be wrapped in white. Those are just both such really pretty ways of describing, you know, um, the moon, the moon. Right, exactly. And they're different ways and they fit the whole because also there's a the whole thing about like nightfall being a problem in the book yep. for them. And, and an early guest is a great because you never want an mm -hmm. early guest. It's it's like and it's, it, it immediately evokes for me as someone who regularly hosts parties like you want things to you. You've, you've prepped everything. You've prepped everything to be ready at six o'clock. And if somebody shows up for at four five thirty you're like i have half an hour of things i had planned to do i am not ready and it's just such and it's such a mundane mm -hmm. that's and that's one of the beauties of uh nix's style is he uses really like a rubber duck <laughs> in a bath in a like well, and that matches her like primary british school um mm -hmm. upbringing so that it feels in character as well um, and so, yeah, I just love this book. I loved how it was written. I love Sabriel. I love the feeling. I love the, the, the finale. There's so much dread in it. Um, I, I just liked it all around so much that I didn't want to read Lyriel, which I remember not liking as a kid because I it's didn't want to ruin it. It's really good. It's, I, and I think you would enjoy it. Um, Lyriel, I think for a lot of you who, um, struggled with the distance between 
the narrative and Sabriel, I think you would really like Lyriel because you are super immediately in her point of view. Um, and then there's another character, Samith, who is actually uh, Sabriel and Touchstone's son. Um, and you are in his point of view a lot as well. Also, he redeems himself for me, Will. So, because I was talking oh, okay. to Will about how he did something annoying. Um, and I was like, fuck you, Sam. He redeemed himself. Anyway, and I mean, I hated him as a kid. I know. I I know. And I know exactly telling, why. I, I'm just telling our writers, our, our, our readers, I, I did not I did not love him as a kid. I For some reason, I just didn't like Lyriel that much as a book. And I didn't like Abhorson that much as a book. Um, oh, I'm enjoying them immensely. I, I think you should give them another chance. Mainly maybe sometime because, in the future once this has faded a little bit. I just remember maybe, being sad, too, that Sabriel isn't like a main character. I guess I did like her as a kid enough that it, it bothered me that she wasn't around a lot. See, I was really, because as a kid, I didn't feel particularly fond to Sabriel. I was fine going on to Lyriel and it was fine, but the world feels the same. The narrator is that, that narrator who's making these comments and who's omnisciently popping in and out of people's head and the way the world is described is the same. So for me, it feels very comforting um, to return to that world. And Lyriel is a very interesting and there's there's like a, a sense of like building towards something because uh Lyriel and Abhorson like Lyriel finishes Abhorson picks up immediately where it left off mm -hmm. um yeah it's very I'm much really... a two-part story if I'm remembering correctly yes and I am thoroughly enjoying it so for those of you that found uh Sabriel was not your cup of tea and you weren't up for it um, I would try Lyriel and see how you feel about it. And then honestly, I would go back and reread Sab Sabriel because I think in the rereading of it within the context of those two books, you might be able to connect a little bit more. Almost more like a prequel, essentially, even though it came first. Um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, interesting. If you, uh, We probably won't do a video on it for a really long time. But if you want Maria's opinions on it, bodger her in our Discord, which speaking of we have a Discord that is a Patreon bonus. So if you've gotten this far and not figured out we have a Patreon, you guys should go, go join it. Um, and then Miss Ali Snow said, I'm a little weirded out by Will being so positive about a book, not going to lie. And Max says, I'm waiting for a structure comment. Um, it, you the structure is incredible. The this book is tight. Is so solid. It yeah. is tight as heck. There is nothing extraneous. I think that's one of the reasons I don't really have many complaints with it is because it is so much just a short, tight book of being what it wants to be, that there aren't moments where you're like, you know, this part wandered or that part wandered or this should have been cut or this character was annoying. It's from and beginning even, to end all the way. Even earlier when he was like, yeah, that scene, what was it? And once I reminded him what that scene was actually doing and adding to the story, like, nah, you can't cut it. It is it is the introduction yeah. to the terrible awful. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I love this book so much. I might reread really parts of it or something. Um, but uh, thank you all for joining us. And by all, I mean three of you. Ooh, wait, Shout wait, out wait. Max and Miss Ali Snow and uh, wait, Jenny. Go ahead. Ali, Ali Snow said, this is... This is how you know we did our, our job. I'll say this much. I will, I'm willing to go back and give the second half another shot at some point. Good. No Followed with, I do have a large TBR pile, but I'll give it another go. If you do, please let us know what you think. Yeah, actually. Because I would love to see, like, how you interact with it on the like finishing the second half and if you find the second half better than the first half because i think from what you said earlier you were looking for it definitely is in the second half so please when you finish it please 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 message i do think the second half is stronger because when i want to go back and reread it i probably would just skip the first half and i'd probably pick up where they meet touchstone God, I because love that's really the, the i love the first half i love the I do like interaction it. with the like british peeps I like the the Horius, by the way, is his name. Horus, Horus, Horus. Um. Anyway, I, I oh, Celia says honestly, this review also made me want to read it. I'm glad it's great. Again, you. I you will pick say up the little details of who. Yeah, that if you're is. aware of the mode it's written in, but also don't force yourself to read it. You know, yeah. like that's the thing is sometimes for this podcast, I have to read books that I otherwise would feel less strongly about if I just, and I just wouldn't finish them otherwise, you know, I would just read it and be like, this isn't my thing. And I would put it down, but I have to sometimes read books that I don't want to like these violent lights. Um, and thus actually... they make having to read the whole thing makes him like it, dislike it more than if he could have just stopped. It's true. He wanted to. I'm never more atheist than when I have to sit in church and I'm just like, no, I don't like this. It's okay if you're doing it in your space, but if I have to interact with it, I don't want it. 
Um, I mostly the one I really think of a lot is Wrath of the Dawn, which was like very much doing its own thing. But like, yeah, I was not there for it and having to read it made it worse. But um, yeah. All right. So um, let us know what you think. Join our Patreon, support independent journalism um, and uh, join us. We do um, a end of book uh, live stream and a mid book, uh, mid month live stream. No one came end to this of, one. End of month. <laughs> That's OK. Yeah. An end of month no, book club. That one you guys like, get to pick. Three. All right, we will talk to all of you uh, later. Bye.